Welcome, today we are gonna look at some of the most notorious serial killers. If you found the video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe to show me you want more videos like this. Ted Bundy was an American serial killer who gained notoriety for his heinous crimes in the 1970s. Born Theodore Robert Bundy on November 24, 1946, in Burlington, Vermont, Bundy grew up in a seemingly normal middle-class family. Despite his charming and charismatic exterior, Bundy harbored dark and violent tendencies. Bundy's early life showed no obvious signs of the monstrous acts he would later commit. He attended the University of Washington, where he developed a reputation as an intelligent and personable young man. However, beneath this facade, Bundy's disturbing proclivities began to emerge. In the early 1970s, a wave of disappearances and murders of young women swept through several states in the U.S., particularly in the Pacific Northwest. The crimes were marked by a similar modus operandi, women abducted, sexually assaulted, and murdered. As the body count rose, law enforcement agencies struggled to connect the dots. Bundy's true nature was revealed in 1978 when he was finally apprehended. Prior to his capture, Bundy had managed to elude law enforcement for years, using his charm and intelligence to evade suspicion. His tactics included feigning injuries, wearing disguises, and even pretending to be injured to gain sympathy and trust. During his trial, Bundy represented himself, adding a bizarre twist to an already macabre story. He used his legal acumen to delay the proceedings and manipulate the courtroom. Eventually, he was found guilty of numerous charges and sentenced to death. Bundy's crimes and the subsequent trial brought attention to the often misunderstood phenomenon of serial killers. Researchers and criminal profilers delved into the psyche of individuals like Bundy, trying to understand what led them to commit such heinous acts. Bundy's case contributed significantly to the development of criminal profiling and forensic psychology. Despite his conviction, Bundy continued to captivate the public's attention. He granted interviews in which he attempted to justify or explain his actions, further cementing his status as a chilling figure in criminal history. His ability to switch between charm and violence, coupled with his seemingly ordinary exterior, added to the terror he instilled in those who followed his case. Ted Bundy was executed in the electric chair at Florida State Prison on January 24, 1989. His life and crimes remain a subject of fascination and horror, serving as a stark reminder of the capacity for evil that can exist beneath a veneer of normalcy. The legacy of Ted Bundy continues to be a chilling chapter in the annals of true crime. Pedro Lopez, often referred to as the Monster of the Andes, was a notorious Colombian serial killer convicted of murdering numerous young girls in South America during the 1970s. Born on October 8, 1948, in Santa Isabel, Colombia, Lopez's life story is one marked by a troubled upbringing and a descent into depravity. Lopez's childhood was marked by abandonment and abuse. His mother, a prostitute, reportedly abandoned him at a young age, leaving him to fend for himself in the dangerous streets of Bogota. The harsh realities of his early life contributed to the development of a disturbed and violent psyche. As Lopez grew older, he embarked on a criminal path, engaging in theft and other petty crimes. His criminal activities escalated, culminating in a series of heinous acts that would horrify the world. Lopez's modus operandi typically involved luring young girls, often between the ages of 8 and 12, away from their families with promises of gifts or money. Between 1969 and 1980, Lopez is believed to have murdered hundreds of girls across Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. The exact number remains uncertain, as Lopez's own accounts varied during different interviews and confessions. His method of killing usually involved strangulation, and he would then bury the bodies in shallow graves. Lopez's crimes went undetected for years due to the transient nature of his lifestyle and the lack of communication and coordination among law enforcement agencies in the region. However, his reign of terror came to an end in 1980 when he attempted to abduct a young girl in Ecuador, but locals intervened and handed him over to the police. Following his arrest, Lopez confessed to his crimes in chilling detail. His accounts of the murders were horrifying, painting a picture of a remorseless predator who viewed his victims as disposable. Lopez claimed that he felt a compulsion to kill, and his insatiable appetite for violence seemed insatiable. Despite his confession and the overwhelming evidence against him, Lopez's legal journey was tumultuous. In 1983, he was convicted of multiple murders in Ecuador and sentenced to 16 years in prison. Shockingly, he served only a fraction of his sentence, and in 1994, he was released for good behavior. After his release, Lopez's whereabouts became uncertain. He was rumored to have been deported to Colombia, where he was declared legally insane and placed in a psychiatric institution. The lack of a definitive account of his fate has only added to the mystique surrounding Lopez. Pedro Lopez's case remains a disturbing chapter in the annals of true crime. 
his ability to evade justice and the magnitude of his crimes have left a lasting impact on the communities affected by his actions. The monster of the Andes stands as a haunting example of the darkness that can emerge from a combination of personal trauma, societal neglect, and unchecked criminal behavior. Herman Webster Mudgett, better known by his alias H. H. Holmes, was an infamous American serial killer and con artist during the late 19th century. Born on May 16, 1861, in Gilmanton, New Hampshire, Holmes would go on to perpetrate some of the most heinous crimes in the history of American criminality. Holmes' early life showed signs of intelligence and cunning that would later be put to nefarious use. As a young man, he enrolled in the University of Michigan's Department of Medicine and Surgery, where he studied anatomy and surgery. It was during this time that he began to engage in fraudulent activities, including insurance scams and identity theft. After completing his education, Holmes moved to Chicago, where he became the proprietor of a drugstore. He quickly transitioned from legitimate business to criminal enterprises. The drugstore building, later infamously known as the Murder Castle, was a labyrinthine structure designed by Holmes to facilitate his criminal activities. The Murder Castle, located in the Englewood neighborhood of Chicago, was a multi-story building with secret passages, soundproof rooms, trapdoors, and a basement equipped with a crematorium. Holmes used this macabre residence to carry out a series of gruesome murders. His victims, many of whom were young women, fell prey to his charm and promises of employment or romantic involvement. Holmes' modus operandi typically involved luring individuals into his hotel, drugging them, and then subjecting them to horrific acts of torture and murder. Some victims were asphyxiated using a gas chamber, while others met their demise through various gruesome methods. The true extent of Holmes' crimes remains unclear, as he often changed locations and identities to avoid detection. Estimates suggest that he may have been responsible for the deaths of as many as 200 people. However, due to the lack of concrete evidence, the actual number of victims is challenging to determine. Holmes' criminal activities eventually caught up with him, thanks in part to the diligence of law enforcement and the work of journalist Nellie Bly. In 1894, he was arrested and later stood trial for insurance fraud. During the trial, the full scope of Holmes' atrocities began to unravel, leading to additional charges of murder. In 1896, H. H. Holmes was convicted and sentenced to death. He was executed by hanging on May 7, 1896, in Philadelphia. Before his death, Holmes confessed to 27 murders, though the actual number may have been much higher. His crimes and the murder castle continued to captivate the public's imagination, representing a dark chapter in the history of American crime and the emergence of the serial killer archetype. John Wayne Gacy, one of the most notorious American serial killers, preyed on young men and boys during the 1970s. Born on March 17, 1942, in Chicago, Illinois, Gacy initially seemed like an upstanding member of society. He was a successful businessman, a Democratic Party precinct captain, and even performed as a clown at children's parties, earning him the nickname Killer Clown. Gacy's criminal activities began to surface in the 1970s. He lured young males, often teenagers, with promises of work, money, or simply by exploiting their vulnerabilities. Once in his grasp, Gacy subjected them to brutal sexual assaults and ultimately murdered them. The infamous crawl space under Gacy's home in Norwood Park, Chicago, became the burial ground for many of his victims. The exact number of victims remains uncertain, but Gacy was convicted of 33 murders. The majority of his victims were found buried in the crawl space, while others were discarded in nearby rivers. Gacy's ability to lead a double life shocked the community. He was active in local politics, a family man with two children, and engaged in various charitable activities. His outward facade sharply contrasted with the sinister activities he carried out behind closed doors. Gacy's capture in 1978 unraveled the dark secrets he had hidden for years. His criminal activities came to light when 15-year-old Robert Pius disappeared. Investigators linked Pius's last known whereabouts to Gacy, leading to a search of Gacy's home. Upon searching Gacy's residence, authorities discovered evidence of his crimes, including clothing belonging to his victims and personal items that could be traced back to missing individuals. The gruesome discoveries in the crawl space shocked the nation and solidified Gacy's place as one of history's most heinous serial killers. During his trial, Gacy's defense attempted to portray him as mentally unstable, introducing an insanity plea. However, the jury rejected this defense, and Gacy was convicted on multiple counts of murder and sentenced to death. His time on death row was marked by failed appeals and attempts to avoid execution. John Wayne Gacy was executed by lethal injection at Stateville Correctional Center in Illinois on May 10, 1994. His crimes left an indelible mark on the collective consciousness, leading to increased scrutiny of individuals who held positions of trust and authority. 
The case also fueled public interest in understanding the minds of serial killers and the complexities of criminal profiling. Gacy's life and crimes have been the subject of numerous books, documentaries, and films, serving as a chilling reminder of the capacity for darkness that can exist within even the most seemingly ordinary individuals. The legacy of John Wayne Gacy endures as a cautionary tale about the importance of vigilance and the pursuit of justice in the face of heinous crimes. Harold Shipman, the British doctor and serial killer, remains one of the most infamous figures in the annals of true crime. Born on January 14, 1946, in Nottingham, England, Shipman's life took a dark turn as he pursued a career in medicine. His crimes would eventually lead to a shocking revelation about the extent of his actions and the betrayal of trust inherent in his profession. Shipman began his medical career in the 1970s, establishing a general practice in Hyde, Greater Manchester. Initially respected and well-regarded in the community, Shipman cultivated an image of a caring and trustworthy family doctor. However, beneath this facade, he harbored a sinister compulsion that would result in the deaths of numerous patients under his care. The extent of Shipman's crimes became apparent in 1998 when concerns about a high number of deaths in his practice prompted an investigation. The inquiry, named Operation Hyde, revealed a disturbing pattern, a significant number of Shipman's patients had died from lethal doses of diamorphine, a powerful opioid painkiller. Shipman had manipulated medical records and forged the wills of his victims, often leaving himself substantial bequests. Shipman's victims were primarily elderly women, and his choice of victims allowed him to exploit the common expectation that elderly patients would naturally succumb to various illnesses. The sheer number of deaths and the callousness with which Shipman had executed his crimes shocked both the medical community and the public. In 2000, Shipman stood trial on 15 counts of murder and one count of forgery. The trial exposed the extent of his actions, revealing that he had likely killed many more patients than the charges reflected. The court heard testimony about Shipman's cold and calculating demeanor, as well as his ability to manipulate both patients and colleagues. In January 2000, Shipman was found guilty of all charges and sentenced to life imprisonment. The judge recommended that he never be released. While in prison, Shipman continued to deny his guilt and maintained that he was innocent. His apparent lack of remorse and refusal to acknowledge the magnitude of his crimes added to the horror of his actions. On January 13, 2004, Harold Shipman was found dead in his prison cell. He had hanged himself with bed sheets. The suicide of the man dubbed Dr. Death marked the end of a dark chapter in the history of medicine and raised questions about the failures in oversight and accountability that allowed his crimes to go undetected for so long. The Shipman case prompted significant changes in the oversight of medical practitioners in the United Kingdom. It led to reforms in the General Medical Council's procedures for handling complaints and concerns about doctors, as well as improvements in the monitoring of prescription drugs. The legacy of Harold Shipman remains a chilling reminder of the potential for abuse of trust within the medical profession and the importance of robust systems for detecting and preventing such atrocities. His crimes shook the foundations of the doctor-patient relationship and prompted a re-evaluation of the safeguards in place to protect vulnerable individuals under medical care. Jeffrey Dahmer, often referred to as the Milwaukee Cannibal or the Milwaukee Monster, was an American serial killer and sex offender who gained notoriety for his gruesome and heinous crimes in the late 20th century. Born on May 21, 1960, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Dahmer's life would become synonymous with some of the most horrifying acts of violence in the history of criminal psychology. Dahmer's early years showed signs of a troubled and isolated childhood. He struggled with social interactions and exhibited a fascination with dissection and animal cruelty. Despite these warning signs, Dahmer's descent into darkness escalated in his late teens and early adulthood. In 1978, Dahmer committed his first murder, a crime that set the stage for a series of increasingly gruesome acts. Over the next 13 years, he would go on to murder and dismember 17 young men, primarily targeting African-American and Asian-American individuals. Dahmer's modus operandi typically involved luring his victims to his home, where he would drug, strangle, and then dismember their bodies. The infamous apartment at 924 North 25th Street in Milwaukee became the site of many of Dahmer's atrocities. Inside, he engaged in acts of necrophilia and experimented with various methods of preserving body parts. Dahmer's apartment served as a grotesque chamber of horrors where he carried out his macabre fantasies. Dahmer's crimes went undetected for several years, partly due to a combination of his ability to manipulate law enforcement, his ability to exploit racial biases in the criminal justice system, and the social marginalization of his victims. Despite being arrested in 1989 for sexual assault and enticing a child for immoral purposes, Dahmer managed to convince authorities that his actions were mere misunderstandings. It wasn't until 1991 that Dahmer's reign of terror came to an end. 
One of his intended victims, Tracy Edwards, managed to escape from Dahmer's apartment and flagged down two police officers. The subsequent investigation uncovered the gruesome reality of Dahmer's crimes, leading to his arrest. During the trial, Dahmer was unapologetic about his actions, openly admitting to the murders and describing the motives behind his crimes. He was convicted on 16 counts of murder and sentenced to 16 life terms in prison. Dahmer's notoriety grew further when he was murdered by a fellow inmate at the Columbia Correctional Institution in Portage, Wisconsin, on November 28, 1994. The Jeffrey Dahmer case shocked the world and prompted a re-evaluation of law enforcement procedures, particularly in cases involving marginalized communities. It also spurred discussions on mental health, the criminal justice system, and the responsibilities of society to identify and intervene in cases of individuals displaying concerning behavior. Dahmer's life and crimes have been extensively studied by psychologists, criminologists, and the media, contributing to a greater understanding of the motivations and factors that lead individuals down the path of serial violence. The legacy of Jeffrey Dahmer remains a haunting reminder of the capacity for evil that can exist within seemingly ordinary individuals and the ongoing importance of vigilance and empathy in society. Jack the Ripper is perhaps the most infamous unidentified serial killer in history, responsible for a series of gruesome murders in and around the Whitechapel District of London in 1888. The true identity of Jack the Ripper has never been conclusively determined, and the case continues to captivate the public's imagination more than a century later. The reign of terror attributed to Jack the Ripper lasted from August 31 to November 9, 1888. During this short but intense period, at least five women were brutally murdered and mutilated. The victims, Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and Mary Jane Kelly, were prostitutes, and their deaths shared chilling similarities in terms of method and brutality. The modus operandi of Jack the Ripper involved throat cutting, followed by abdominal mutilation. The killer displayed a disturbing level of surgical skill, leading some to speculate that the perpetrator might have had medical knowledge. The brutality and precision of the murders, coupled with the killer's ability to elude capture, created a climate of fear and panic in Victorian London. Despite the efforts of the police and the extensive media coverage, Jack the Ripper was never apprehended. The case remains unsolved, with numerous theories and suspects proposed over the years. Several letters purportedly sent by the killer to the media and police, including the infamous From Hell letter, added to the mystique surrounding the case. However, the authenticity of these letters has been a subject of debate among historians and investigators. The lack of concrete evidence, the primitive forensic techniques of the time, and the absence of reliable eyewitness accounts contributed to the difficulty in solving the case. Theories about the identity of Jack the Ripper range from local butchers to members of the royal family, and numerous suspects have been suggested over the years. However, none have been definitively proven, and the true identity of Jack the Ripper remains one of the greatest mysteries in criminal history. The Whitechapel murders and the legend of Jack the Ripper have left an indelible mark on popular culture. The case has inspired countless books, movies, television shows, and even walking tours of the crime scenes in London. The character of Jack the Ripper has become a symbol of urban terror and the dark underbelly of Victorian society. In recent years, advancements in forensic science and historical research have led to renewed interest in the case. Some investigators and amateur sleuths continue to pursue the identity of Jack the Ripper using modern investigative techniques. However, the likelihood of definitively solving the mystery dwindles with each passing year, as the case becomes more deeply entrenched in the realm of legend and speculation. The unsolved mystery of Jack the Ripper continues to be a subject of fascination, drawing in historians, criminologists, and true crime enthusiasts. The story of the Whitechapel murders serves as a chilling reminder of the challenges in solving crimes from a bygone era and the enduring allure of unsolved mysteries that capture the public's imagination. Thanks for watching today's video. If you want more videos like this, don't forget to like and subscribe.